He's a partner in PwC's Sustainability and Climate Change team. He's the co-founder of the sustainability advisory firm Sustainable Finance. Um, and he's written another book called Turnaround Challenge and the lead author of PwC's Low Carbon Economy Index. So uh, we've asked him to explore progressive economics, Buddhist economics if you like, maybe we can't call it that. In fact, Schumacher, I think in your program, said if I hadn't called it Buddhist economics, people wouldn't have listened so much. So he was being deliberately challenging in doing that. So we've asked him to explore progressive economics in an age of climate change and try and answer that question, can we, in organic cotton, change the course of business? Will you welcome Leo Johnson, please? Thank you. That is such a nice introduction. Um, and a lot of it was written by my mother and is like self-propagandizing. But it's true, but, it's, but a lot of it is true. I used to, um, I did write this book. It's a completely unreadable book. I want to be very, very clear on that. Um, it's, and it's, I know loads of you have done really much bigger and harder things than writing a book, but just to show you how much it was a struggle, one little illustrative moment is so we had the cover ready, finally, it was done. And we had this brilliant title called Turnaround Challenge. And I'd had this genius idea of taking the letter R in turnaround and turning it around. And what I thought was this kind of avant-garde, sexy, sovietique way. And I showed it to my dad in this very proud son-to-father moment. And he looked at it and he said, yeah, like in Toys R Us. It was very bad. It was all, <laughs> all we had to cancel. You know, but look, so ignoring, ignoring all of that, um, I have sort of functioned vaguely in some parts of my life as an economist. I used to work at the World Bank as a resource and environmental economist. I know there's like shudders, shudders. Going, I used to, and, um, and then I set up a company that got bought by PwC um, in a process that I came to realize was slightly more of an acquisition than a full-scale merger between our organizations. And, um, and um, since then, I've been doing sort of other stuff, including this Radio 4 stuff, a series called Future Proofing, trying to get a sense of what is coming down the track towards us. I don't know what you feel about this, but it seems to me that there is a certain amount of stuff going on that could create possible futures that are very, very different. Um, I don't know if anyone else feels that. I know it's very early in the morning. But what, and by the way, I salute you for being up already and do just feel free to relax in this session and go quietly to sleep. If your neighbor drifts off, just let them go. Let them go. Um, what I'd love to do is just play with, um, I want to tell you one story and show you one picture and then see if we can get a handle a tiny bit on this question, what comes next and is small the next big? Or is it something that's absolutely the opposite of, of small? Okay, so look, let me start with a story. And the story is, you've already, took, you've already taken up all my great Schumacher gags. Um, but you know, there's the, he, he was this totally biggest economist, okay? He was worshipping at the, the temple of, of, of big. You know, he was, the director of, of, he was the director of the National Coal Board. He'd been at the World Bank. And there was this one moment in his life when he had a, an epiphany. And he hardly ever talked about this story. It's buried deep in his book, Good Work. But, it, but it's this. He, for some reason, really liked England. I don't know why, but Schumacher really liked. Who, is anyone here from England? OK. <laughs> Schumacher really liked the place you are. OK, fine. And he went over, and as World War II broke out, he was in England. And you know, as relationships got, got increasingly tense between the two countries, the British basically made this decision to round up potential enemies and to put them in, in farms. And so Schumacher, this economist, was put on a farm. And there was this poor old British farmer who finds himself with a German economist on his hands. He, oh, what am I going to do with, 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 with E.F. Schumacher? Um, so he came up with this great solution, which was to get Schumacher, the economist, really play to his strengths and get him to count the cows. And so that's what Schumacher did. For a lot of the war, his job was to count the cows. And there were 32 cows in, in the herd. And every day, Schumacher would go out, stand on the sign, and he would count the cows. And then he would report, there are 32. It was great. The weeks passed, the months went on. Then one day, um, Schumacher went down to the field. And as he's there enumerating the animals, um, he sees an old farmer leaning against the hedge. And the old farmer says to him, the cows, they're never going to flourish with you counting them like that. <laughs> Schumacher looks, 
<laughs> what do you mean? What on earth are you talking about? He goes back home, goes back to his, his, his rooms, ignores it. The next week he goes to count the cows, and there's a cow missing. There's 31. He wanders around, he looks around, he goes to find the farmer, goes on a tour of the land, and there, lying in a ditch, legs up, dead, is cow 32. And it's at that moment that Schumacher had this realization that defined the rest of his career, which turned him from, a, from, a, from an orthodox economist to a heterodox one, which is, it doesn't work to stand in the field and do long-distance tele-enumeration of the cows. The only way, if you want those cows to thrive, is actually to get up close to them, to look at their eyes, to see how is their sheen on their coat, what is the fur on their tongue. That is the only way you can actually tell if a cow was working. And this was this insight that he had. As Western economies were starting to move from artisanal, rural, small-scale production models to mass production, and I guess what struck me when I read that was we are, and this, this farmer was on this metaphorical fence between these two, that we are on this metaphorical fence again. We have been living in that world that the old farmer leaning against the hedge was warning about, the world of mass. We've been living in that world of mass, in the city of Henry Ford. And the question is, what is the next mode of production that we're headed towards. Is it Fordism on steroids? The steroids of GM, of synthetic biology? Is that the future that we're going to? Or is it going to be something different? Okay, that's my story. I hope you've all survived that story about a German economist and a dead cow, which I agree is not a great way to begin. A, um, what I'd now like to do is to show you one picture, which for me um, kind of could encapsulate this. I've got a picture. Lisa, thank you very much. I could have done that. I could have, man I could have managed. <laughs> I have the skills. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for your, your, faith, your faith in my competence. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Okay. So this is the story. Um, so, you know, you, you all know, this is cliche to trot out William Gibson, you know, the, the sort of no self-appointed noir prophet of cyberpunk. But he says the future's already here. It's just not yet evenly distributed. So I think in this one picture, you've got, in a way, three different cities of the future, models of the economy, that we could be heading towards. Um, so, anyone take a guess where this is? Give me a guess. Africa. Yeah. And it's actually Kenya. It's about half an hour from Nairobi, 45 minutes on a, on a bad day. Um, and, okay, so if you were to be sort of interrogating that in terms of worlds, the seeds of possible worlds that could spring up. What do you notice about that picture? What stands out? What information have you got, first of all, about the problems that we might be confronting? What do you notice there? Sorry, say that again. Climate change. Land use change. Yeah, I mean, these are fields that used to be cotton fields. You've got an industry in Kenya that doesn't really have very much going on. You've got an industry where, essentially, the fields have failed. The crops have broken. And part of this is, of course, is mass production that de-skilled people, that slathered the land with pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, that initially boosted productivity, then took it down, that wasted the water, Part of it, of course, is climate change. But, you know, one of the syndromes you've got that for Schumacher, and I think for all of us, is going to be the defining problem of the 21st century, is distressed migration. That as the fields have failed, what you've got is a pattern of distressed migration that's taking 200,000 people a day across the world from the broken countryside, where you see them absent right now, to the megacity. And there is a prediction that by 2035, there's going to be 4.9 billion people in Asian and African megacities alone. So this issue of land use change, of the countryside failing, and people fleeing to the megacity, it becomes a problem if those megacities also happen to be ones which are low-lying, which are likely to be hit by flooding, and which, on one projection, are going to be leaving 600 million people 
in those Asian and African megacities with a pretty desperate need to be moving somewhere else. I mean, if you want to find a recipe for electing populist demagogues who want to erect walls, the failure to address this broken countryside is pretty high up, is pretty high up on the list. Okay, so that's, for me, you could call it City One, which is the city of Henry Ford, which is off screen here, but it's the place that everyone has fled to. And it's Nairobi, and it's Lagos, and it's Kinshasa, and it's Sao Paulo, and it's the city that's crumbling, that's clogged, that's overcrowded, whose systems have started to fail in front of the onslaught of distressed migration. And what that first city, the city of Henry Ford, which is basically the 50 years, 50 to 70 years that we've all lived in, has then spun off, is of course the recovery mechanism, the response. And that response, you see it in the poster that is proudly up there, Konza, uh, ICT Technopolis Vision 2025 flagship project, which is a $15 billion smart city. This, I think, is a second glimpse into a possible future. Future one is we could be rooted in mass. We could just stay with the broken fields. We could stay with the swamped megacities. We could stay with an economic model that's basically fossil fuel-driven mass production and see how that gets us. City two is you move from the city of Henry Ford to the city of Facebook. And that, in a sense, is the city that we've got there. It's the age of the algorithm. So has anyone heard of CRISPR? Yes. S scary. So CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas9, and I did a, I did a long interview with, with Jennifer Doudner, the founder of it, the other, the, the other week. Um, you know, this is basically like Microsoft search and replace for the splicing of, of, of genomes. So if, you know, if GMOs were a pretty blunt instrument, the scary thing for many about CRISPR is just how fine it is. You can basically single out individual strands, and you can say, I want longer earlobes. You can say, I want my kids to have better twitch muscles so they can throw the javelin. You can splice a flounder gene into a tomato. You can come up at the same time with drought-resistant crops, which they are now trying with certain strands of cotton. What you've got is a city of the future that's coming up where tech can start to unravel a certain number of our assumptions. So a kid being born today, what's their maximum life expectancy? Anyone give me a... 100? Anyone give me more than 100? 150? 115? Anyone give me more than 115? Okay, so are those who are saying there's children already born who are going to live to 150? I spent a, a, a day the other day with this guy called Aubrey de Grey. Anyone heard of him? Yes? Massive beard. Um, plan B for Aubrey de Grey is to freeze his head cryogenically in a tank of liquid, liquid nitrogen just so that he can be, 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 be reconstituted once, once the science has, has um, got, got better. Um, but plan A is just, as he puts it, to end death. Now, he says that there are already be kids living, living to 150. As I mentioned, he's saying there are seven deadly things that kill us. Each of them we're pretty close to fixing. That um, There's this thing called longevity escape velocity which is the rate at which life expectancy is improving. And right now, every 24 hours, it improves nine hours. All you need to do is to ratchet that up a little bit, not just with end-of-pipe fixes, but with stem cell rejuvenation. And at that point, he reckons anyone in this room who is under the age of 50, which I've been scanning the room, is clearly absolutely everybody by a long, long way. Um, he says you have a... 50% chance, yes, every single one of us has, this, this is gobsmacking, okay, a 50% chance of living forever. 
short of some you know, extraordinary accidents like you know, turtles dropping on our heads, etc., et dying like Aeschylus. He's basically saying we are going to end death. I could go on and on with some of the disruptions that this city of the future, of which you just see a little tiny signpost here, promises to hold with the deployment of tech from quantum computing to blockchain disruptions to Larry Page co-investing right now in two simultaneous rival startups, each of which will be doing passenger-bearing megadrones, i.e. ushering in the hybrid Uber that just, just does both road and air. Larry Page saying actually that air is much easier to do than road because you don't have you know, old grandpas falling over in the middle of the street in the roundabout, etc. I could go on and on about what some of these disruptions promise to look like, but I think there is one thing they've all got in common which is, it's the deployment of tech with an intent. This is a quote from Kentaro Toyama, the former Microsoft research director, who used to say, technology is not the answer, it's the amplifier of intent. And I think in each of these deployments, what you're seeing is a pattern, which is technology deployed with the intent not to address the problems that we've got, not to address the problems that confront the many, but to erect the wall, to erect the Barrio Cerrado, the gated community, where you have a smart city model of an economy where, for a few, tech is used with a panopticon of surveillance to help it to make life as good as possible, sometimes even exponentially better for a very limited group of people. And the task is to erect walls that are high enough to keep the majority out. And that is the gated community city. I went and visited four of them in Kenya a while back. In one of them, built on an old coffee plantation, there's a 12-foot-high armed um, guarded electric security wall. And I asked, what's happened to the coffee farmers? They said, well, that's all gone, but there is a museum of coffee. There is a museum of coffee we're going to have. So is that the world that we're going to be going into? Is that the world of agriculture, where not just GM, but transgenic, mutated crops will be providing the baseline of agriculture, and where as many jobs as possible will be off-peopled to the algorithm. There's an Oxford Martin School study that suggests 47% of white-collar jobs will be lost by 2035. Or is there a third possible world that could start to form? And I think in this picture, you can also see the seed of that third possible world. So it's not just the broken fields of the old city of Ford. It's not just the Technopolis, the second city of Facebook. There's also this possible third city. And so this group, Raggle Taggle Group, is one of Nairobi's 15 or so different innovation centers. It's part of the, um, the iHub, and they've got a whole load of stuff that they're doing, which is just trying to fix some of the problems that are out there. So they're doing stuff on the ovulation of cows. They're doing stuff including linked to the team that came up with M-Pesa. They're doing a thing called M-Copper, which is a very, very simple piece of technology. It's just taking the solar light, the D-Light, which is great because it gives power to some of the 1.4 billion people without it, and then by putting a chip in the light, it means that people can afford this thing, which might otherwise cost over 100 bucks. Suddenly, with a chip in it, you can turn it on and off remotely, which means that there's no risk of it being nicked, which means that you can then lease it for about 40 or 50 cents a day, way less than people are spending on kerosene and firewood. And then suddenly with that, they've not just got power, they've got banking, they can make savings into their micro finance account, they can start to do microloans, for example, for the Kickstart hand pump, which gets them access to the underground water table in the 98% of unirrigated sub-Saharan African land where it's actually available, which enables them to triple the amount of crops that they can plant, which takes incomes in one study up from $180 a head per year to 1800 and it's, by the way, something with, um, uh, with uh, M-Pesa that the African Cotton Group is already using to help them try to grow their business. What is the point here? 
if Toyama is right, and it's all about intent, then what you're seeing is the stuff that could start to make this economy work has got solving the problems that we've got at its core. And the big question, Liesl, to get to yours, then is, well, what does solving a problem look like? Does solving a problem look like increasing efficiency? Because if that is how we define the problem, then, of course, we will come up with solutions designed to increase efficiency. Or does solving a problem look like promoting well-being? Does solving a problem look like putting something with people and an ecosystem that's going to be there for the long term right at its heart and coming up with the solutions that are going to work for that? And if that is the model, then what you're starting to see is that there is no giantist solution. There is no one quick fix solution. But what it looks like is a series of highly small, highly resonant initiatives that are rooted in the local. I guess what was so great was in, 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 in listening to the, your introduction, Liesl, and to the, the, the range of the people here. For me, there is the small, there's the big, neither of them work. The thing that works for me is the massive small. The massive small is you, when you have a small that is done that is actually rooted in the local and in an understanding of the local and what the real needs are of that specific, specific condition. And then what resonates will replicate. And if you've got the people here who can know what's going to work and then know exactly what to take, exactly what to spread, exactly what to replicate. It may look like the task is enormous, but you've got exactly the conditions to make it ripple out and grow. I will end with a quote from that great philosopher, Marilyn Monroe, who said, sometimes good things fall apart so that better things can fall into place. I think we've had the century of Henry Ford, and of course it was a good thing. It lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty but it started to fall apart. It started to have greater problems than it's got benefits. Is something better going to fall into place? I think something worse could fall into place if what we move to is just the city where we are ruled by algorithms. But I think there is the possibility of something better falling into place, and it will be the sum of the type of stuff that you're all doing. To any of you who are still conscious, thank you very much indeed for having me. Thank you. Thank you.